After completing several builds of various scales and grades, I wanted to share my experiences through my many missteps and successes. This video is part of my model build tutorial series and will be about gate removal. The gate is the part of the runner which connects the model piece to the runner, and that's this right here. This little lot part here that goes right down to the piece. Each piece will have two or more gates, typically three, but the larger pieces will get four or more. Although I'm working with a Gunpla kit, the contents of this video can be applied to any model with pieces on runners. Okay, first I want to go over the tools that I use. Now, it's with removing the pieces from the runner, it's important to have a set of model nippers. Uh, these are just basically cutters that will cut the plastic off, uh, as opposed to just, you know, kind of twisting it off because you don't want to leave nub marks or damage the plastic of the piece itself, and these are great for cutting through. Now, if, if you have this is this is a double-edged one where both sides are sharp and have an edge. Uh, there are higher uh, quality ones that are called single blade. And what it is is you've got one of these has a, sh a sharp, you know, relatively sharp piece. And then the other one is just kind of a flat piece. So there's only one blade that actually does the cutting. So that's the difference between your normal model nippers and your single uh, blade nippers. Also, um, you can use various uh, grades of sandpaper because once you nip the piece off, you're going to have some left over from the runner in the gate, which is called a nub, and you want to get rid of that. So you would use sandpaper and you would start from a, a heavier grit to a to a lighter grit in order to be able to, one, the heavier grit will remove the nub and then you progressively go down with some lighter grit to remove the scratch marks and give a nice polished finish. Now I normally use a 600 grit to remove the nub mark and then I'll use a 1000 grit or a 4000 grit um, to remove and polish the plastic after the nub is gone. Now, those that aren't familiar with using sandpaper, the higher the number, the finer the grit. Essentially, what it is is the number of grains per square inch. A little bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it's talking about. So, you know, 600, if you can just feel it, it, it is still very smooth, but it is rougher. Sometimes, if it's a really big nub or type of plastic that's a little bit harder than what I'm used to work many models are I might go with a 240 and you can definitely feel the difference of the grit size or maybe just a 400 would be enough but I try to do the uh, finest grit that I can because the the uh, the lower the number the more likely you are to make scratches which are deeper into the piece of the plastic itself now other than using um, sandpaper, a step up is to use a glass file. Now, I use a razor. This is done, this is uh, made by um, Gun Primer. And this is really nice because basically the grain on this, if you will, are really just little teeth of uh, glass and it, it's a dot pattern. So you can get really, really fine. Uh, cleaning with this when removing it and I find that when I use the um, glass file especially th this one the razor I don't need to worry about removing scratch marks because the, the teeth are so fine it really doesn't scratch it it just removes the nubs and then kind of self polishes it when you're done now sometimes depending on the plastic how soft it is there might be some scratches and then I might use a balancer which is a really fine grit sandpaper essentially with a thicker um, thing to hold on to to have more control over. Now one thing I forgot to mention with the sandpaper, I prefer using the sponge backed ones because then I can bend it and have much more control over it and control really where it goes. Another thing that you really want to have is a 
hobby knife, sometimes also called an X-Acto knife because that's that's the most popular brand is X-Acto. So this is just your typical, you know, sharp blade that you can use to, you know, remove really big nub marks before you use the um, sandpaper or the glass file. Or I also use this to remove nubs that are on clear plastic. No matter what the color of the clear plastic is, I'll use this instead of the sandpaper or the glass file because these can uh, leave scratches that are difficult to remove. And even if you polish the clear plastic, it might become, it might look cloudy as opposed to clear anymore. So that's what I do. I also have tweezers of various types. This way I can hold on to really small pieces while I'm cleaning them. Otherwise, you know, my fingers are a bit big and it's difficult sometimes to really hold on to the piece and still have access to the nub. So I'll just take out, you know, some of the, you know, so most of mine have really sharp, you know, end and really fine points and stuff like that. And I'll just hold on to them with these. Makes it a lot easier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Another thing that I have is just a cheap toothbrush because cleaning up, cleaning the nubs off is going to create this very fine plastic powder. And, you know, it, it does get in, you know, you can tell that it gets and clogs in with the sandpaper because that's what those marks are here. I've used that piece. But it also can get embedded in the glass file. So what I'll do is I'll just brush it with the toothbrush and get all that fine powder out of there. That way the, the teeth of the glass file here is always, you know, are always there and doing their job and stuff like that. Another great um, tool are your fingers. You'll, if you watch my builds or my, my, my prep videos, you'll see that I'm constantly rubbing the edge of the, of the piece. What I'm doing is, one, I'm trying to find other nub marks, or if after I've worked on a nub mark, I'm just rubbing where the nub mark was to make sure that the nub is gone so that it's nice and flat and smooth. You can tell the difference between the nub mark, which is going to be a rough part on the plastic, as opposed to, you know, when the, the nub is gone, it's nice and smooth. So fingers are great tools in being able to take care of that. Now, one of the other things I do, because what I like to do is I take all the pieces off the runners first before I do the build because I like to have everything ready for when I go to build, I'm just putting pieces together and then applying any, you know, stickers, you know, color correcting stickers, or mostly, you know, the stickers for the glowy parts, like the eyes and, and the lenses and stuff like that. I don't want to have to worry about taking nub marks off while I'm building it. I just prefer to just go through the process to build all on its own. So when I'm taking those, pieces off, what I'm doing is I'm taking them off, I'm following the manual by section, and then I'm putting the pieces into a case like this, where I have, you know, this is just a 36 uh, uh, grid storage, normally used for things like beads and stuff like that, and what I've done is I've taken the dividers out and made areas where I can store, you know, the, the right arm, left arm, head, waist, and I've even marked on the back here what is in each, what each section is representing. And I use this for my 144 scale kits because they all, the pieces all fit here and I've got my accessories and an extra one for whatever it needs to be done. Um, and this is great. And what I've done because these I found that the dividers were moving. I wound up gluing them down with like a fabric glue. Fabric glue works best because this is vinyl and many plastic fabrics are vinyl or vinyl derivative. So this glued them right in so that the pieces don't move from place to place. I tried using model glue, but that's not designed to work with vinyl and it didn't work at all. So I used the fabric glue instead. So this is what I use for my 144th kits, and then I also have 
these larger ones, and this is what I use for my 100 scale kits or the very large 144th scale kits. And I'll use this too. And this is just a three tier with compartments. Once again, I took the dividers out. I glued the parts that I kept so that it doesn't move around. And once again, I just marked, you know, what goes in everything. Oops, upside down for you guys. I uh, marked everything. And this is great for, for the larger kits. In fact, when I do the, when I show my techniques, I'll be using this one here because the model that I'll be using to show the nub removal is a full mechanics 1 100 scale kit. So these are great. And in the, in the um, description below, I have put links to these two types of kits that I use um, because they can be difficult to find. It took me a while to figure out and find the ones that would be most helpful for me. So I wanted to put links below in the, in the uh, comments, and I mean, not the comments, the description to make sure that if someone wanted to use these the way I am, they can find them easily. So, so those are the tools that are being used. One thing to keep in mind is that when you're removing the pieces from the runner, the, uh, the main thing you're trying to do is make sure that you get the pieces off the runner without damaging the plastic of the piece or leaving behind stress marks. And stress marks happen, it's basically kind of a white or cloudy mark where the gate attached to the piece, the gate being where the plastic passes through um, when uh, the injector molds the piece. And that white area is a stress mark because what happens is sometimes, especially if it's a if it's a double bladed um, or a less expensive pair of nippers, it can exert stress or pressure really on the piece when removing the uh, nub. If there's just too much plastic or too much, I'll show as I'm taking the pieces off. Um, and it causes that, and then sometimes it can be difficult to remove that. And if it's if it's in a visible area, like on armor or something like that, it would show this like little white area, especially if it's a non-white piece on the model itself. So you're trying to prevent those as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to have a pair of single-bladed nippers to do that final cut off of the of the gate off of the piece. But what what you would normally do. And the nice thing is, is that especially in newer kits, and I think this has always been happening in the higher grade, you know, the larger kits or the higher grade kits is when you're working on an area like arms or body or whatever, one of the very first things they'll do in the manual is tell you which runners you're going to be working with. So you can collect those together and then you know what runners you need to take the pieces off of ahead of time. This one happened, I'm working on the arms for this, and this is my full, uh, full mechanics aerial model that I'm actually building right now, but I want to use it as an example in this tutorial because it has a lot of the things that um, different techniques are used for, so it's a perfect model to do it for. Um, this one essentially for the arms, I'm taking pieces off of almost every single gate anyway. So what I normally do is I'll look through the instructions on the of the part of the model I'm building to find out and just go through and take the pieces off each runner as I encounter it. So in this case, the very first runner that we're going to be dealing with is D. So let me get D. And we need to get uh, D17, 23, and 24. Now, if you're using a double-bladed set of nippers, what you want to do first is you identify the pieces. So we've got 23 and 24 right here. So the first thing you want to do when you're removing the runners is you want to nip. First, you want to separate from the runner. And what you would do is you would nip above where the gate attaches so that you have this little kind of nub of plastic remaining on okay, well, let me zoom in a little bit here so it's easier to see there we go 
So you have this little nub of plastic right here. And that's what you want to do for all the runners first. For all the, the where the gates are, you want to nip them off. Leave that little bit of plastic. And this is actually a perfect example. See that white mark right there? Let me get it to focus better. That white mark right there, that's a stress mark. Now, the fact that this is on the runner doesn't really matter. But you could get those kind of, of marks on the piece as you're removing it. And the reason that was there is that the piece of plastic I was nipping through was really thick. And it was attached to this entire runner. So there was a lot of stress on that piece right there as I was removing it. Then what you'll do is you will take your nippers and you want to be as flat on the piece as possible. And you want to make sure that the flat side of the nippers is up against the piece as opposed to pointing away from the piece. And then you would just nip off that remaining part. Now, if it's really, really thick down here, and the nice thing about Bandai is that the gates come to a nice little point. So there's very little plastic on the piece itself for the most case. Sometimes they might have to be a little bit thicker. So if it's a bit thicker, you might need to do additional nips like that to make sure that you get as little, as little plastic that you're nipping through on that final bit. And then you do that. So you're going to be doing at least two cuts, if not more, depending upon the, you know, the, the, the plastic and stuff like that. And you're going to wind up with all these little tiny nubs that you're going to constantly want to be moving away. I just use a little brush like this, and I'll just, from time to time, just collect them in a pile so that when I'm done, I can just, you know, collect them all and throw them away or use a vacuum and throw and suck them up and stuff like that. So, and then if you notice, you've got all these little nubs left, and that's okay. That That's what you want to be left with when, when you're done with the nippers. Now, with... If you have a um, single bladed one, what you would do is you would go ahead and use your double bladed ones to, re to do the initial removal from the runner, just because double bladed ones tend to be cheaper and you don't want to be using your single blades just to do this initial step, just because they're normally a bit more expensive. And then you just use the single blade, you put it right up against there, and you just nip it off. Essentially, when you're using a single bladed nipper, you want to think of the single blade as an X-Acto knife. So really, it's an X-Acto knife that you're, you're manipulating with a hinged joint. So the flat side, you would put right up against where the gate meets the piece. So right up against that, and then you're just moving the single blade to it to do the cut. And once again, you're left with a little nub. The single bladed uh, nippers will leave a smaller nub than typically your double bladed ones were would. Now, what I have is God Hand, and I've got their higher level um their their best set which is the SPN 120s and these are really really good in that these do such a nice cut that i don't need to worry about the initial removal from the runner and then wind up with all these nubs with these i can just take the piece directly off the runner right at the gate so i need 17 as well so what I'll do is, once again, you just use the flat side as the anchor. Now, when you do this, you want to make sure that you're as flat against the edge of the piece where the, run, where the gate attaches, and then just nip and remove it. And you do that for each piece.
and it leaves a nice, it still leaves the nub, but that's going to be easy to take care of. So you got the nubs there, but not the stress marks. And this right here, this was a curved piece, and I was able to get really close, and it pretty much removed it all. Now, if you want to try doing that, I would highly recommend, if you do have a nice pair of single edge nippers that you that you can do it directly from the runner without the initial worrying about the initial cuts to get it off the runner still do it with the two cuts and just practice getting your single blade right up against in the proper angle and stuff like that onto the pieces for a while before you do it directly um, it won't take long. You just need a little bit of practice on how this angles and stuff like that. But I, I would I would recommend doing it only if you have god hands, because these are the best. I mean, these are the platinum standard of nippers. Um, these are great. Now there are some that are really close. If you have another pair of of nippers or single bladed nippers. Go ahead and test it and see if you can do the same thing, um, especially as time goes on. You know, at the time of filming this video, the SPN 120 God Hands are the top of the line in existence right now. But other manufacturers are trying to catch up and they might eventually do so. But go ahead and test it and, and see if you can do it or not. It, it being able to cut it directly off the runners without these initial steps saves so much time. I mean, it, it literally saves half me half the time it did before, before I started doing that. And I can just get through this pretty quickly. So, now there's another couple pieces I want to take off. I want to take off some of the armor pieces. So, we're gonna, I'm going to get the C runner here. This is C1. Here we go. We'll take off a couple. You know, these here look like they're inner frames, so a lot of the stuff isn't going to show on those. Um, but what I want to do is I want to I want to get the ones off here. It looks like this is the shoulder pieces, so let's go ahead and get these off. And notice they have many runners, especially if it's like a, a a letter and a number and the number just increments. That means that parts of the of the runner are duplicated on those. And in this case, you know, they've got two C runners, one and two, which have different shoulder pieces because there's two shoulders. And if you notice here, it says the, these are the arm units. So you're doing the common arm units first. That's why there's the times two, right? Oh, sorry, I zoomed in away from it. That's why there's the top times two right here. And then here it's showing you, you need, you need these pieces from both, from both C1 and C2. So you need 17, 18, and 20. So I'll do 20 first. And there's a reason why I'm going to do that. Here we go. So I was what, almost doing it, doing it with the wrong ones. I thought they felt different in my hand. So we'll take 20. And then we need 17 and 18. And that's these two pieces. And we'll go ahead and nip these ones here. And then this other one is what's called undergated. And if you notice, if you notice like with these ones, it, 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 the, the, the gate attaches right to the side of the piece. But with this one right here, there's this little extra nub. There's this little extra raised part right there. And that's called an undergate. They do undergating in cases where it's going to be, the piece is going to be more visible. So they want to do the attachment on the underside of the piece. The underside meaning 
the part that won't show once it's assembled. So they'll they'll do it there, and, and you do this a little bit different. So I'm going to do an initial cut first just to get access, because this one's just difficult to get to, and, and it leaves that little part right there. And then what you do is you come back, you want to be as flat to that surface, and then you just nip the rest of it off. And that's how you remove an undergate. And for the most part, it's going to be pretty, pretty flat. Even though it's undergated, you still want to make sure you get rid of any leftover nub on here. Only because if you leave that nub there, it might prevent the piece. It's not going to be visible, but it might prevent pieces from fitting together properly because you have that little bit of plastic that's not allowing it to snap in. And, and yes, the, these models can be that precise with just this little tiny nub that you can barely see, but you might be able to feel will prevent pieces from going together especially on your, your, your larger models or your higher grade ones like real grade or something like that. So it is important to make sure you clean that up. Um, so, and what I do, what I normally would do is I would get all the, I would work with one, you know, one section at a time. So in this case, this is a case where we're working, this section does both arms, but I would work on all the pieces needed for the right arm and all the pieces needed for the left arm because Normally with your arms and your legs, you'll have a section that is pieces common to both. And then there'll be a little, there'll be a smaller section for each one where you've got the right and left pieces that are unique for them. Because, you know, especially like the hands, because the thumb has to be positioned in a certain place. Or, you know, a joint needs to work a certain way for right arm versus left arm, stuff like that. So I'll work with one at a time. So I'll take all the pieces off and clean them up all at once. So what I'll do is I will then, once I have all the pieces off, I'll put my nippers away and I always, especially with the god hands, I always put the case, the cover back on just to protect it. I very rarely have my double-edged ones out, but I do keep the cover on this. Get them off to the side. And then what you want to do is you want to remove leftover nubs. Now, you may look at certain nubs like this right here that's on the end of what looks like it's a, it's a connector piece. But there's a nub right there. And once again, you want to make sure that you get rid of that nub, even though it's not visible, because that little bit of plastic where this peg goes into a hole to hold the piece in, that little bit of plastic left over on the nub may prevent the locking mechanism of that, you know, peg into the hole from engaging and the piece is going to constantly be falling out. So if, if you're using sandpaper, you want to start with a smaller number for, for a more coarse grit. And you just, you're just going to sand it. And you're going to feel to make sure that it's gone. I mean, in, your figures cannot be more important in this step to be able to feel. So once once the piece is is, is sanded down, then let's let's say that this is you know you're, you're going to kind of take a smaller grit. I mean, uh, yeah, a, a a finer grit. So this is a one thousand. I used a six hundred for the initial sanding. So the one thousand is going to come along to remove the uh, scratch marks from the 600 and then I'll finish it off with a 4000 to really get it now you know I may not use the various grades you know, various grits of sandpaper when it is just something that I know is going to go in somewhere because it doesn't need to look good um, but I just wanted to give this example as so that if this was showing then it would um, you would want to do it that way because then you'd have a nice polished, smooth surface showing like on armor or something like that. And sometimes if there are definite scratches, I might use a balancer. The balancer is just a very fine grit. This is probably more like a 10,000 or a 15,000. And you can just go over and, and get rid of, you know, any final 
bits. Essentially, this is a polisher. It's like a like a sing a single sided polish box. Whereas a polish box would have multiple different grades of of fine sandpaper on it in in a block. You know, so normally it would be four. So that's how I would do it with um, sandpaper. However, I prefer using my glass file because once again, this is very nice and very fine. And what I, more times than not, I can just get rid of the, the nub mark and it'll polish at the same time. So it won't leave a lot of scratches, depending upon the type of plastic. If you've got a really soft plastic like an ABS, there might be some just, you know, might be some cloudiness or some small scratch marks, and then I'll just go over it with the balancer, which this also happens to come from Gun Primer, and I'll just go over it um, as needed. Um, I don't use that very often. Very rarely do I use that when I'm using the glass file. But what you would do is, you know, th this is rigid, so you just kind of keep it flat. All you're trying to do is get rid of the nub mark. You're not really... You're not trying to scratch away the plastic. You're just trying to make the plastic even again. So what I do is I'll just hold it and I'll essentially allow the weight of the file do the work and let the teeth do the work as opposed to pushing it in and trying to get it. Otherwise, you might do damage to the plastic. So I'll just kind of lightly, and if it's on an edge, I might move it around a little bit, especially if it's in a round piece or around a, a curved edge, I might just kind of do things like that. Or sometimes if I'm, if I'm not getting it, I might need to go at a slightly different angle to get all the plastic off. But essentially it'll just come right off and you've got a nice polished piece as well. So let me find the third one. There we go. And this is another thing, since I, since I remove all the pieces before I do the filing to get the nub marks off, I also use my fingers to help find the nubs on the pieces because sometimes once you get them off, especially since, you know, the God hands leave such small nubs, you may not see them, but you can definitely feel them if you rub across. So once again, just kind of be, just, just, just let the, let the file do the work for you. The plastic is soft call this right arm. The plastic is soft, you know, relatively soft, so it's going to do the work. Now here's one. There is a little nub mark, um, but I do want to remove it, especially since this looks like it's going to be at a, at a joint and probably provide some articulation. And I want to make sure that there's not this little nub mark that gets in the way of the articulation. So I'll and this is one where, since it's curved, I'm just going to kind of skirt across it. And I might go across like that. And then I'll just wipe it away and then just feel with my finger. Okay, that look, that's good. And then this one is a little bit bigger of a nub, but I'm still just going to use this. If it's really big, I'll nip it again with the nippers. And I might just do a circular motion from time to time, and that just to get it from multiple angles at once. And once again, since this is inner frame, and this is definitely a peg that'll go in for joining, all I'm trying to do is get is make it level with the other the other plastic around the piece i'm i'm not going to care about you know little you know dust particles and stuff like that i just want it to be level and then i'll do one of the um armor pieces now this when you're dealing with an armor piece or something that's going to be visible this is where you're going to be more cautious about you know, scratches or anything like that, or deforming the piece. So once again, you're just going to be much more, you know, keep it as flat against the piece as possible, because essentially you, what you want is the file, once the nub is gone, then you can feel that the, there's more surface area that the file is, hold, is, is on. 
and then you know that the nub is gone because you can feel more resistance. And we're not talking a ton of resist more resistance, but you can really kind of feel the difference or at least hear the difference also. Because there will be just a, I doubt the microphone's picking it up. There's a little kind of, a little bit more squeaky, scratchy sound going on when you're on all of it. So once again, you just use your finger and as you can see, it leaves a nice little polished piece there. Now the nice thing also with Bandai, they do try to put the gate at where, you know, things aren't going to show. They're not always able to do that, but that's what they try. So right here, here's a peg that's going to hold things together. This probably, this piece probably swings out with the two halves of the shoulder connecting and this being held in place. But you still want to get rid of the nub mark just to make sure that things fit together and you're not going to interfere with the uh, articulation. Older kits, Bandai wasn't as careful because I don't think they had the technologies at that time to be able to be more careful. They had to kind of be like, well, the, you know, the, the, the plastic being injected requires, you know, can only spread this far. It requires this number of nub mark, these, this number of gates, and they have to be spaced this far apart. So you would get a lot more, you know, in the middle of a piece, you would have, <laughs> you know, a gate with a nub mark that you would have to remove. But as technologies get better and they can be more precise, that's why, you know, the newer kits have less and less seam lines and stuff like that, where the actual, you know, molding dies come together. So, and this one too, like I said, you've got the, the tiny little remaining nub from the under gate right here. So you want to make sure you get rid of that as well. And once you get used to building a number of models, you pretty, you can pretty much predict where the gate or the nub mark is going to be. So you'll have an idea, oh, okay, since this was there, then there's got to be at least one opposite it, or maybe even two opposite it on the other side, spread apart type of thing. Now one thing right here, there's there's some angular pieces. So when I when you rub your finger across, you might think that you're feeling a nub mark, but you might really just be feeling the edge of the piece. Because once again, as technology improves, they can be more precise in how the piece is formed. So it'll feel like there's an edge, there's a nub there, but it's not. Let's see here, so this was the under gate, so there's supposed to be two right up here. Maybe that, maybe sometimes, sometimes they will actually put the nub mark right there. But I might have also, with the nippers I was using, I might have cleaned that off as I was doing the nipping. So, and of course, you know, if you miss a nub mark, I normally will have my file out or my nippers out for when I'm building it in case there's a nub mark that I missed or I didn't get far enough down, there's still some left over and the pieces aren't going quite together. So that that's okay too. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind is, especially if you have a, if you have a model kit that has some metallic coated plastic. Now this, the plastic, you know, the runner itself is this silvery color. And then what they've done is they've gone over it with a thin layer of, of red metallic color. And these are going to be effect areas on the model. And many times what they do, especially if there's a lot of showing pieces, this type of piece runner will have a lot of undergating because of the fact that they want to make sure those nub mark, those areas where it connects will not show. Now, in this case, all these pieces, these are effects that are going to be cut, that are going to be in the model, but they're going to be covered up with clear plastic pieces. So the edges aren't going to show and stuff. So what they've done is they've connected them by where either the, you know, the pegs are or to the side. 
because they know that they're not going to show in the model. And that's important. Let me just take one of these off to show. And of course, you want to be really careful with these. It, it, you know, j just so you don't do, you know, scratches or take off more than you want it to. Because this red part is just a very fine coat. Because the real plastic is underneath, it's the silver. So if you take off, if you accidentally nip off an edge of one of the pegs, or even a place where, it sh where you know, it might show, it's going to be this, the underlying plastic color as opposed to the red. And then you're going to want to take off the the nub mark. But at, if you notice, you're going to wind up kind of ex rubbing away some of the actual red color. And it's going to expose the color underneath. Now, the fact that these are on where things connect, that's a good thing. You know, the... There, that area is not going to show, but it, it's inevitable that, you know, when you're working with coated plastic, no matter how careful you're trying to be, you're going to rub off some of the coating when either you're nipping it off or you're cleaning it. Yeah, there's no way to avoid that. So, so that, that's, that's a special case. I just wanted to, you know, let, be, make you aware of that when working with metallic pieces or metallic coated pieces there are there's also plastic like you now this is a great example because this undercoat this underbelly or the, the real runner color is a silver metallic where the silver color is injected is part of the entire bit of plastic and, and you might have non-silver colored pieces that are that way as well. Normally your silver is your gold, stuff like that might be the plastic is that color as opposed to a coated bit like the red is where there's just a coating over the other plastic. Now the other special types of plastic to deal with that I don't use even the glass file on is clear plastic. And once again, you just be a little bit, you, you be careful with removing the nub, so that you're not going to, the, the clear plastic tends to be a little bit softer, even though it's the same type of plastic. <coughs> I'm assuming the clear, the fact that it's clear, there may not be as much plastic in the actual piece. It's probably a lot more, you know, you know, the, 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 the mechanic, the way of creating it clear probably has less overall plastic in certain areas, so it's a little bit softer. So you take that off, but there's still nub marks remaining. And with the clear plastic, no matter what color it is, I don't use sandpaper, I don't use the glass file, because that will leave behind scratches, and no matter how fine a grade I use, it'll still leave behind a cloudy looking area. So what I'll do is I'll use my finger to find the nub and then I'll just use my exacto knife or hobby knife, I guess is the more generic term, and just kind of go across with it. And that will eat away. That'll just take little bits and pieces of the nub off. Find another one. Which I think a lot of them were in this effect area. And that, that was probably a choice so they don't show as much since you've got uneven plastic anyway. Here we go, we've got one yeah, right here. I can definitely see it. I don't know if you can see just a slight discoloration there. A little bit, a little bit white. And what I'll do is I'll once again just kind of Try to get as rid of as much of the nub as I can. Sometimes if it's in a really awkward place, instead of going across with the blade, I might just try to, you know, cut away little bits at a time. But another thing I'll do is I'll have the blade flat down on the piece and just kind of scrape it away a little bit at a time. Once again, I'm not really pushing down. 
And that might just get all the plastic you need in the right place so that you can come back and just kind of remove it. And then just be left with a nice little, the plastic at the color it's supposed to be. So I, I always do that for these. I use the X-Acto knife instead and just be very careful because it is a softer plastic and you can, if you've got the blade at too much of an angle, you can really cut in pretty badly um, into it. So I'm just putting those in there in my storage areas and I'll, as I do the rest of the model, I'll worry about, you know, getting everything in the right place and stuff like that. So, so those are the different uh, techniques I use. Um, when doing um, the, the gate removal, um, you know, whether it's undergated or not, whether I'm using the hobby knife or the razor, I definitely prefer using the God hand nippers and the razor because that saves so much time of having to go over, you know, nip more than once, go over a certain area with sandpaper more than once. It just a huge time saver. And for me, with the number of models I do, you know, I try to do at least one build every other week. It saves so much time for me, especially when dealing with very tiny pieces like real grades and stuff like that. I mean, I, I've handled thousands and thousands of pieces. <laughs> so you can imagine the amount of time saving I've, I've been able to do. And then whenever I'm done with the, the glass file, if you can see, there's that powder there. That's from the plastic. And you can even see a little bit of the different colors. There's the red from the metallic coating. And I'll just, I'll just brush it right out so that I just have a nice clean, you know, the bristles. This is just a, you know, I, I, I use a hard, cheap, as cheap a toothbrush as I can get with hard bristles, with stiff bristles. And um, it'll clean it right out. And then if I... I guess I don't have enough to show a lot, but there's once you've gone through a model, you will have basically a pile of. <laughs> forget that I zoomed in. You'll have a pile of this dust, essentially, and there might be a fine coating all over the place, depending. Well, here are some tips and tricks that I've learned, which will help with the gate removal. Many of these I may have covered briefly while doing the rest of the video, but I wanted to get them all into one little area to just summarize them in the video here. So the first thing I do is I remove all the pieces from the runner before I do the build. That's just so that I can just focus on the build when the time comes. Since I'm removing all the pieces, I put them in these uh, organizers that I've got where I set up the sizes and mark where I put certain things hurt certain segments so I can organize them by segment. That way when I'm putting them together, it's easier to find the pieces uh, because I won't be able to use the numbers in the manual. I just need to look at the piece and say, oh, here it is. And over time, I mean, it, it might seem anti-productive at first if you haven't done it before, but the pieces are easy to distinguish um, in the manual while you're putting it together. There have been probably from the thousands and thousands of pieces that I've had to move, deal with in this way, excuse me. Um, there might have been, you know, a dozen pieces where I couldn't quite match up to the manual. And that was because the manual was kind of doing an x-ray vision thing on me where it would show the piece, but it would also show the inner um, connecting parts of that piece. So it was like, I'm looking for something with Lot, you know, ridges on the outside of a piece, but it was showing me the ridges on the inside <laughs> instead, um, which was confusing, as you can imagine. Once I figured that, and it made me think, wait a minute, did I not take everything off the runner, or did I lose a piece? What's going on? And then finally I realized, oh, it's this, and they're showing me the stuff inside. <laughs> so just keep that in mind if you decide to use this technique, and, and it does really help a lot, um, for me at least. Um, I, I, once I got onto the single blade, um, nippers and was able to just remove the, them from the runners directly, the pieces, um, as I've said before, it was a huge time saver 
Same thing with the file. I prefer using the glass file. Um, I like the gun primer uh, razor. They have two different sizes. They have a, they have one that's about two and a half sizes wider than this. I prefer the small one because I can get into more places with it. Whereas the really wide one, there's you you limit yourself. This is much better. You're dealing with very small bits of plastic, so you're not going to be trying to remove a nub that's as wide as this. I'm sure that's for more cases where if you're trying to say it's, you know rough up plastic for say like um, primering or something like that then that would be a good thing to use but I don't do that so um, I just use this small one and once again this has been a huge time saver for me um, there is you know the, the glass file a little bit more than the sandpaper the glass file does build up the dust from the plastic that you're removing so just clean it off with the toothbrush from time to time you'll know that it's happening because what will you know suddenly there'll just be more dust collecting on the piece than before and then you'll look at the at the file and you can just see the the dust all in there so just brush it out um i would recommend getting a glass file that's specifically designed for model kit building because they tend to use um, dotted pattern as opposed to lines. If you get the uh, na the uh, the nail care fi glass files, they're going to be rigid lines across. And I find that that takes off a little bit too much plastic um, and isn't as precise or as, as, as doesn't give the nice polishing effect that this does you know, with, with the little, basically little teeth of plastic and, um, you know, of glass instead. So that, that's just, you know, another little thing to keep in mind. But, you know, try whatever. If you want to go with glass files and you, and you can get one or you know someone that has one that uses from their nails, try that. It might work great for you. So these are just things that I, that I use. And then you're going to want to change your, your hobby knife uh, blade regularly. Most cases, it's just loosen and take it out and then put the new one in and tighten. There are other hobby blades out there that make this process much easier. They might have like a, a locking, you know, mechanism or something for the blade instead. You'll know pretty much when it's time because suddenly you're not able to get as precise a cut. Um, or, you know, it, 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 you, you'll tell. You'll be able to tell. It's suddenly not as sharp. And you always always keep in mind the adage, a sharp blade is a safe blade because if it can't cut as well, you're going to be putting more pressure and then suddenly it's going to give away and you might be cutting your thumb or something like that. But if you keep a sharp blade, then that's not going to happen. And, you know, I, I, I've had this since the beginning. I've done 15, 16 models of various sizes and I've only replaced the blade twice and I just recently replaced the blade before starting this model that I'm using for the um for this this set of tutorials that I'm doing so you're not going to be changing it super often or anything like that and of course it all depends on how much you have to use it you know before I was using you know at the beginning I was using the uh rate the, the hobby knife to initially get most of the nub mark off when I was just using sandpaper before so I use it much less now so it'll last longer and I I've got the hobby knife where it came with this little protector and I always make sure I put it back in some hobby knives have covers stuff like that so if the blade is protected it's going to be last even longer okay some safeguards to keep in mind um, if you're working with resin plastic and a lot of um, secondary market um, kits that allow you to enhance your model with you know maybe more detailed armor stuff like that a lot of those tend to be resin plastic well resin plastic can be somewhat can be harmful if inhaled so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are wearing a mask um, also since there the filing creates a lot of plastic dust. If you're sensitive to that type of thing or, or suffer from asthma or anything like that, you probably also want to be wearing a mask while doing the nub cleanup. Um, 
if you do need to use a mask, make sure that you're getting an NI, I'm sorry, yeah, NIOSH approved N95 mask. The uh, NIOSH is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and they certify masks. And, N and N95 is essentially a, uh, a mask that'll uh, filter out 95% of particular uh, air content, essentially, you know, dust and stuff like that. It, those are the types of masks that everyone was looking for at the beginning of the pandemic period. Um, now, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, there are a lot of um, not as reliable N95 masks out there. So if you're looking for an N95 mask, make sure that it is, in fact, NIAOSH or NOSHA, NOSH certified. Um, you can pretty much guarantee that if you're getting it from a reliable and reputable uh, manufacturer like 3M or something like that, and also you're getting it from a reputable um, store or website. Um, you know, if you're getting it from Amazon, um, make sure it's sold by Amazon, not just shipped by, but sold by because they're going to make sure that if it's an N95 mask that they're selling, it truly is a certified N95 mask. I have seen, when I was first starting working with this and, and looking for the masks to use, I would find a, uh, the description would say it was uh, Nyosha approved N95, but then when I looked at the, the image that they provided, the mask said N95, but it didn't have Nyosha in front of it. So I would ask the question, is this truly an approved mask? And one person replied, yes, it is an approved mask. And then I said, well, then why doesn't the mask say Nyosha on it? And their response was, well, if, if we say Nyosha on the mask, then uh, Amazon will delist us. And we didn't want to do that. Well, the only reason why you don't have Nyosha N95 on your mask that you're producing is because it's not truly approved by Nyosha. And if you have a mask that says that and Amazon finds out that it's false, then they will delist you. No one, if it's truly approved by Nyosha, would not put that on their product. So just keep that in mind out, out there. I mean, it, if it if the deal is too good to be true, it's most likely because it is not true. Um, and then another thing is, I didn't bother with it for this video because I was just doing a little bit of uh, gate, you know, nipping and stuff like that. But sometimes my hand will get numb if I uh, do a lot of nipping. So what I use is I just, this is just a compression glove, a fingerless one. And I'll just put this on and this provides enough support in my, my wrist area and allows the blood to flow nicely where I, I can do an entire model without getting my hand getting stiff. And it's basically just my right, since I'm right-handed, I just wear it on my right hand because that's the only one that gets affected. And because I do everything with my right hand, I might as well not even have a left hand <laughs> except to, you know, hold things. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. You know, if, if you watch my videos with the gate removal, you'll see I'm wearing this all the time. And it, it, it it's super thin. And it doesn't look like it does much, but trust me, it does a nice, it, it is nice. I hope this video has been helpful, especially for those trying to find ways to make their gate removal easier. Please feel free to share your successes and failures in the comments below. If you have any questions that still need to be answered, please leave those in the comments below as well. I will get to questions as soon as I am able to. In the description, I've left some links to some of the products that I've used in this video. I have also provided links below in the description to some helpful videos by Barbatos Rex. He does an excellent job where he reviews and repairs multiple products that performs the same function, such as paints and tools. 
The links below are for his videos on single bladed nippers and hobby knives. If you follow the links below, please politely tell him that Gumpla Shoshinsha sent you. Thank you for watching this video right to the end. If you did enjoy it, please do give it a thumbs up. That does help out the channel. If you would like notifications as to when new videos are posted to this channel, please do subscribe and hit that notification bell. If you do have time, please do enjoy one of the videos that are popping up around my head.